Hello and welcome back to another Battletech guide. My name is Saiken and today we're going to take a look at part two of the most burning questions. Today's topic is going to be how to deal with heat in Battletech and also how to deal with additional equipment for your mechs. Before we begin, I recommend checking out some of my other videos that I'm creating. I usually play strategy games on this channel on the highest difficulty and have a few world's first achievements under my belt. So after that shameless plug is now out of the way, let's jump right into the actual question. Today we're going to look firstly into heat management. Heat management is an integral part in Battletech and being efficient with it will save you quite a bit of headache. Our example that I want to use today is a grasshopper, one of the famous heavy mechs that you're using. And the reason why I've chosen this mech is because it loads quite a few laser weapons, energy hardpoints, and quite a few support hardpoints. And let's just say, for the sake of this argumentation, I would want to deal uh, with exactly that loadout. So we got uh, four starters, attack, uh, in order to increase the energy weapon damage, a couple of medium lasers, in this case even ER medium lasers, which create 20 heat each. And then we just nailed it with even more pulse lasers, Ignore for a moment that all of them are plus plus weapons. It's more a question of how to manage the heat. And I'll take all of the heat related items out of it uh, for now. And we're just taking a look at the basics. Every single mech in the game, with the exception of Star League mechs in Battletech, will have an automatic sinking of 30 heat. So the mech itself is a huge heatsink. That means the first 30 heats, so to speak, are completely free. <coughs> On top of that, you would have Starlink mechs. Uh, they are much rarer, but they do have, quote unquote, a dual sink chassis, which would automatically sink 60 heat. The grasshopper in this case being the grasshopper hr 5 h So the standard version of the grasshopper has 30. If you also, look at that, all of the weapons together have 185 heat. So now let's uh, start talking about what is a good amount of heat versus heat sinking. Heat sinking in this game is important because essentially you per default start off with 100 shutdown heat that uh, you are being able to see here. Meaning if you exceed 100 excess heat, the mech will shut down and that has catastrophic consequences because with a shutdown mech the enemy can directly target shot you and you will lose your next turn. So a full overheat is never going to be recommended. So in order to combat that there are a couple of things uh, to, to do. Uh, number one, you could have experienced pilots that re uh, respectively are increasing the shutdown heat by up to plus 30. So all of a sudden you're no longer dealing with 100 extra excess heat but 130. On top of that, you do have an item such as a heat bank. In this case, the heat bank plus plus here would offer us a 15 additional uh, overheat threshold. So after that's being built in, you would now see that the shutdown happens with 130, which is the maximum heat that uh, you can now take and the threshold for actual overheating. So that is the lower version before shutting down also increased by 15, which means heat banks are typically one of uh, the valuable items that you're going to use in order to stabilize a highly yeah, heat hungry mech. I would definitely disagree with the assessment of uh, the game here, which all of a sudden has uh, created or put the heat efficiency from one to essentially putting in the heat bank and then making it 10. And that is not a fair reflection of, uh, or 12, sorry. It's not a fair reflection of how heat would work in reality. What you want to think about um, with heat management is you want to make sure that your excess heat meaning the alpha strike heat minus your heat sink, so the delta, needs to be compensated for multiple rounds. Very seldomly you are going to have a situation where you're simply alpha striking the enemy falls over and that's that. 
Typically you are fighting against an entire lance, oftentimes even against two lances at a time, or you do have a couple of other uh, things that you need to do, i.e. using jump jets and so on and so forth. So when I'm calculating heat and heat efficiency, my rule of thumb is that I want to run about a 20 heat uh, differential. And that accounts for the fact that you would theoretically have around three rounds of full firing before overheating. The standard of um, the overheating starts at 60 and the full shutdown would be at 100. And even if you go all out with 20 differential, meaning alpha strike minus heat uh, sink value, you would still be able to run five rounds before everything collapses. Now, of course, you potentially wouldn't go out uh, in all of the five rounds, but the question is not whether or not you want to do it, but how long you can sustain in a fight. Most of Battletech's fight is different than other strategy games like XCOM. It is not a full alpha striking game unless you reach the very, very end game. In most of the cases, it is some sort of attrition war where better placements and better activities from your side will lead to better results. Now, there is the theory in some of the forums, if you read it, that you just need to alpha strike as hard as you can, and then the enemy will simply not be able to retaliate, and, and you're trying to kind of recover a couple of rounds, and then you're alpha striking again. With all of the missions and just how the game itself works, unless you vastly outclass the enemy and are able to essentially eliminate an enemy mech with one to two mechs from your side continuously, you will find yourself in a spot where you might be able to alpha strike one mech down with three to four mechs focusing on it, but then you're completely overheated. So net net of all these aspects that I'm trying to show is you want to be able to reliably and round after round be able to apply damage. And the way you want to do that is by having a overheating uh, capacity that is about three rounds um, worth of your delta. So let's use the standard here where the overheat capacity or the overheat borderline is 60 and the shutdown is 100. So if you go in with a 20 differential, meaning alpha strike minus heat uh, sinking is 20, you would have three rounds of uh, fighting before you overheat, and then you do have another two rounds to basically decide whether or not you still want to go all in. Now, clearly this mech here would be way too hot, so we're looking at 185 over 30, so that's a differential of 155. So that means in the first round of an alpha strike, we would already shut down, so that's unacceptable. Now, let's talk about heat uh, management and how we can increase it. Number one, you want to make sure we're starting with the very, very basic functionality before we build anything into the mech of the biome. So the biomes in this game are essentially the different planetary environments that you're fighting in. They will increase or decrease the heat efficiency. The ones that are most efficient i.e. making the heat sinks more efficient, will be polar with 120%, tundra with 110 and tropical with 110%. Those three typically are environments that you would like to bring hotter mechs in. The ones that are less favorable are from least, to, uh, from least favorite to sort of a little bit less favorite, lunar, with a 60% heat sink efficiency, Martian 75, Badlands and Desert both have 85%. So Lunar, Martian, Badlands and Deserts, typically environments where you will even get less heat sinking out of it. Mind you, that also includes the 30 standard heat sinking that you see. If you would go in with that mech in a lunar uh, landscape, you would essentially just get 20 heat sink out of uh, this bad boy, a little bit less than that, 18 to be uh, precise. So that means in hot mix will work much less well in these environments. Secondly, there are a couple of terrain effects. Water will increase cooling by 50%, uh, which is helpful. Then there will be ice, which also increases the cooling by 50%. So both of them, one is in the polar uh, region, the other one is in normal uh, weathered regions. If you really are running hot, these are options. 
There are also zones that you typically don't want to take. The geothermal uh, zones, for instance, will increase heat. So it applies kind of a dot type of heat on top of it. So you don't want to be in, in those zones. But I expect that you know the, the basics of it. Now, let's go into heat management in terms of what kind of items are effective. You want to reach a heat differential of 20, really. And if you put in a heat bank, that slightly would increase. So instead of uh, 60 as a overheating uh, threshold, not shutdown, but overheating threshold, all of a sudden you're now at 75. So that also means you can now run a 25 deficit instead of a 20 because you have those three rounds. So the first thing that I typically try to uh, find is a heat bank because it gives you a little bit more leverage. Then secondly, let's talk about exchangers as uh, those are interesting as well. We do have an exchanger, we do have an exchanger plus, and we do have an exchanger plus plus uh, as options. Those typically come in with the exact uh, same linear increase. An exchanger plus plus is four tons for minus 20%, exchanger plus three tons for 15%, and an exchanger two tons for 10%. Net net. That means a ton for 5% heat reduction. If you compare heat sinks to those, the baseline of a heat sink is always to reduce three heat for one ton. So let's put one heat sink in here. You can see heat efficiency increased from 30 to 33. So instead of running 155 uh, heat differential, we're all, all of a sudden only running 152. Now, exchangers come in incredibly handy when you're having above 100 heat. The reason why that is, let's take the easiest example. If we take a single exchanger for two tons, so that is an equivalent of six heat that you would uh, be reducing. And we're just putting this in instead of 185. All of a sudden, it only creates 166 heat. Mind you, it's being rounded down, so you take a bit of advantage with that as well. So I've I've created 19 heat sinking with just two tons instead of six. And essentially, you're continuing to do that uh, all the way until kind of you reach that point where putting in an additional exchanger might not be that efficient anymore. Would I have normal heat sinks? I would potentially go all the way down to um, 80 heat because there you would still gain eight heat sinking for two tons instead of six heat sinking for two tons so even 70 heat can still be argu argumentatively efficient to put exchanges in the reason why i wouldn't go down all the way to 60 is the following there is an inherent advantage in having also a higher base in terms of heat sinking. Meaning, if you are closer to an overheating and you need to take that one round of uh, time to cool your Mac down, it is a huge difference whether or not you only reduce it by 30 or whether reduce it by 50, 60 or whatnot. In terms of efficient heat sinking, like getting that base up, I tend to try to use double heat sinks whenever they are, they are available. There is an, uh, they, they, those are incredibly difficult to get in the game. The easiest way of uh, reliably getting those is being rewarded or honored with the pirates and just going through the galaxy and essentially going black market after black market, look for uh, Star League technology or even entire Star League mechs. Get those guys together and then extract the three to four, sometimes five double heat sinks. The disadvantage of them is since they are so incredibly valuable and you can't normally purchase them, or if you can purchase them in very rare quantities, you tend to not have that many of them available. And if they got shut down, it actually stinks quite a bit. So after I've built in all of the stuff that I've just built in, we're now down to a whooping uh, differential, uh, differential of minus 70 instead of 150 that we had at the beginning. So with just a few tons here, we substantially increase the heat efficiency. Now, there is 
a thing such as quote unquote a fake heat and the way that i define that is some of the weapons in this case the small weapons really do not fire every single turn it is very likely that most of the time we're kind of in that medium range distance and before we're getting closer the enemy either already dies or whatnot but the small pulses will only happen ever so irregularly so take the heat that all of them will generate six in this case times 10 so that's 60 heat so if i take 60 heat off of that we're already at that sweet spot of around 60 heat so i'm running a heat differential of minus 20 uh, of 20 meaning that with the standard weapons i would uh, continue to be able to fire and fire and fire for five rounds in order to, uh, to uh, fight the enemies only if it's needed i would uh, be able to take the small lasers and then maybe overload and need to take a break afterwards so that is how i would build heat in general i tend to specifically on the hotter biomes uh, I tend to use not so heat hungry max or at least have one alternative in there so that's really where the ballistic weapons begin to shine which brings us to the second part of this guide which is equipment in general so let's take a look at equipment and i will quickly go over the highlights so the equipment pieces that you definitely wouldn't want to miss and then the other equipment items that are also quite nice number one as the equipment item piece that you definitely do not want to uh, miss are communication systems. They are costing you a slot but are weightless. So with the right communication system you increase resolve gain. Even a comm system, a standard comm system without any pluses in there is a fantastic addition to a mech. I cannot stress how strong these systems are. If you run four mechs and all of them have a communication system, you will just get more resolve. And with more resolve, the game will become gradually easier. The alternative to that is the cockpit mod with injury resistance up to three bonus injuries. And that is okay. It does not prevent you from being singly headshot. So the head always with its 90 armor sort of is prone to that the cockpit really will not protect you against that which means the only thing that it um, saves you against is continuous overheating continuous explosions in your mech continuous knockdowns and there are other means to prevent you being hit in the first place typically mech warriors have five hit points so that cockpit mod really is not that good compared to the communication system the th third system for the head is the rangefinder rangefinder increases the so-called view distance view distance is the distance of engagement towards uh, the enemy it does not increase the firing range it increases your vision range engagement distance to the enemy sometimes fog of war comes into a conflict and if you don't have a scout uh, usually what tends to happen is the uh, vision range will help specifically long-ranged sniper type of builds and can be quite helpful. There are isolated cases where I would say that a rangefinder could be valuable, for instance, if we would uh, play with a PPC type of build. But in general speaking, although they are um, weightless, I would rather favor the communication system over them. Moving on to the torso slot, where typically you are putting the gyros in there. Gyros are stabilization devices and come in two different forms, although they are not marked as such. So one of uh, the gyros, or one series of the gyros is the anti-melee uh, hit uh, and defense. So defense is anti-melee and melee hit. Uh, version and the other one is the stability damage taken version let's start with the melee versions if you're going for a dedicated melee attacker plus melee hit isn't a bad thing because it will overcome eventual melee defense melee defense as well as the steering of the pilots the only way how uh, melee attacks can actually be avoided normal evasion blips will not count towards the evasion that's a great way of bypassing it however a pilot that is good in melee defense and it has a lot of uh, that 
will make it more difficult for you to even get hit. The melee defense is just like any of the uh, targeting modules, a flat 5% chance to, uh, get, uh, to get hit or not get hit. So three melee defense will be 15% additional miss chance on top of what your pilot is bringing to the table. Same for melee hit, kind of goes with, uh, without explanation. The other type of gyro is the one for stability damage taken, and that is typically the one that I am going for. So uh, this one here is a fantastic uh, gyro, as you would take 30% less stability damage. And that is in so far helpful, as there are two thresholds with stability damage. One in order to lose all of your evasion blips and one in order to knock you down. So that's the unstable threshold and the knockdown threshold. With 30% less stability damage taken, that on top of it stacks with, uh, uh, with effects such as bulwark and terrain effects. So let's say you do have a bulwark a pilot that already takes 40% less damage. That also means 40% less stability damage. And then afterwards, even 30% of that is being reduced. So it is more efficient than it looks here because the percentage is being deducted afterwards. Absolutely fantastic, but also quite expensive item. Costs zero tons, so there is no reason not to take it. Which brings us to the next mods, which are typically the arm mods. And these are a bit weird because there are a few arm mods that are still without tonnage. Those are the basic arm mods. And the only thing that they take is room. So really, when you are building a mech, there is no disadvantage to theoretically slap in a couple of arm mods on top of it. In this case, for instance, we would be fine with all of our heat manipulation, which means that these arm mods, so the uh, 50 additional melee damage, would just come on top of it at zero tonnage. The higher you go in the arm mods, there is more stability and more melee damage that you would get, but it also comes at the price of actual weight. So if you take, for instance, 60 melee damage with the triple mod, that still comes at one tonnage. Uh, I think everything from the plus mods uh, onward starts to weigh one ton. So basically, if you really want a dedicated fighter, you would still go for the plus 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 mods. But if you just want an addition that really doesn't cost you anything other than space, this one here would be the way to go. Keep in mind, though, it still costs something and also days in terms of repair. Nonetheless, this guy here would be punching as if he would be a assault mech although it's just a heavy mech so i can recommend them not necessarily in every single mech but if you have kind of a close range brawler then it is definitely the way to go leg mods are a difficult uh, subject there are a couple of people that like death from above uh, with a few skills and then the reduction in self damage I personally think Death From Above is a complete trap and waste, so I'm not going to cover most of that. It requires a lot of setup. You are exposing yourself. You are unstable afterwards. You're taking damage. Yes, it is great damage for very moderate uh, heat costs, but my line of argumentation is the following. Typically, melee attacks happen when you're in melee, when you do have, or in melee range, when you do have a lot of additional support weapons and you're anyways there and want to save some heat. In that case, melee attacks make sense, but in order to do lag attacks, it typically requires you additional heat. So the heat reduction, so the net heat reduction that you would achieve out of that play is limited. Plus you're putting yourself in a vulnerable spot. So I generally tend to avoid lag modes. Mortar, fantastic, fantastic um, additional item. However, it's more a weapon than an equipment. I can simply say whenever you do have the option to uh, run at least one mortar and you do have a mech that is heavy enough to do that, before I would put in a ballistic weapon, I would potentially go for a mortar. Which nicely brings us to the set of TTS weapons. There are three different TTS weapons which are targeting systems. One for energy, one for ballistic, one for missile. They come in all uh, types and forms. 
and essentially they become more accurate but more tonnage heavy the heavier you go it is my understanding that they do um, not stack with one another so you cannot put uh, multiple accuracy mod modules of varying kinds in there but you can have three of them for the uh, three different weapon categories and what it really does is it is a nice way for low gunnery pilots in order to increase uh, their damage. Specifically, the one for missiles should be called out because missiles, contrary to other weapons, are not completely his hit or miss, but they essentially will do a percentage damage based on your percentage hit. So let's say you have a 50% hit chance and you're launching an LRM-10, five of the missiles will hit, five will miss. That, and that's always going to be like that. With the plus accuracy, you are increasing. With plus, uh, plus three accuracy, you would increase it by 15%. So it's net-net quite a bit of damage if you multiply it with the amount of extra weapons. Just like tags, I tend to run that on um, mechs where it would make sense. It begins to fall a little bit off in the end game, and I'll be honest with that as well because you have so much resolve via the comm system and such great gunnery skill that even if someone with six, seven blips who would rush by would still net net be a 50% hit if you're using targeted shot. And that typically with enough damage will either knock it over or kill uh, the enemy. So instead of going for TTS systems in the late game, I would rather suggest you load up more damage this grasshopper here, for instance, has a nice 550 firepower. That's a pretty heavy punching, uh, heavy mech. Then we do have two final uh, pieces of equipment. One which is incredibly overpowered and one which is, I would say, above average and can be useful in the right, in, in the right combination. So let's start with the X1 AP equipment which is a prototyping uh, sensor lock. It's super rare and at the same time also super niche in the way that it is being used. So first of all, it uh, mimics the Raven ability of basically pinging and sensor locking all of uh, the enemies in range. It has a cooldown. It, uh, it tends to be an option for, let's say, hot or heated mechs. If you run a lot of energy weapons, then you tend to have a bit of tonnage left over. So in those builds, these uh, area lock-ins aren't bad, specifically if you have enough follow-up. Now, the disadvantage of that is an opportunity cost of using a single round in order to effectively use the equipment instead of just trying to hit the enemy. So it's a nice way of replicating the sensor lock ability and it really takes a lot of blips off of multiple enemies. If you then follow up with a multi-shot and take another blip off of many of the enemies, then you all of a sudden have completely um, stripped enemies and, and can basically shoot them down. So it has its usages, although they are maybe more niche. Now the potentially strongest equipment in the game, game breakingly strong it is, is the X1 ECM. The ECM equipment is standardly built into two mechs, one of them being the Raven, one of them being a Starly uh, version of a heavy uh, mech, uh, the Cataphract. These generators can be built into any of uh, the mechs. They are not only expensive, but incredibly rare. And if you've seen my run on very high difficulty, I took out the Raven after a few missions because it just became too easy. The way that you can manipulate the enemies into not being able to run into you, into essentially finishing their turn and just bracing and in a nutshell you standing and holding your ground and uh, still being able to take multiple multiple shots without any retaliation is well worth the six tonnage. I would definitely run it in any strong or, or highly competitive lance. It's just the strongest equipment in my perspective in the entire game. 
and uh, therefore I'd be really careful whether or not you want to play with it because it trivializes the game. And that's really it. That's the guide to equipments and heat management. I hope you found value in it. Try to be as concise and as fast as possible. If you do have comments and or differentiating opinions uh, to both of these topics, feel free to leave a comment down below and give the video a like. See you on the next guide. Bye bye guys.